Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to today's Modern Sales Pros Masterclass on Mastering Your Sales Data, presented by the team at Brainshark. Before we jump into our content today, um, we do have a MSP tradition, and we've got two new panelists here, so really excited to uh, find out a little bit more about them. And Greg, let's, let's start with you. Uh, any new hobbies picked up or old hobbies uh, honed since the start of this amazing pandemic that we're going through? I uh, have been playing more tennis than usual. And uh, for the first time ever, watching the NBA playoffs in September. All right, all right, exciting stuff. Tennis is a good socially distant sport too, right? You're kind of on the opposite side of the court from each other. So no, no yeah. chance of contamination there. Yeah, you got the, uh, got the net in the way. That's good, that's good. And then Liz also, uh, first, time, first time panelist here. Any new hobbies picked up or old hobbies honed since the start? Uh, Rich, I'm doing a lot of weeding these days. We planted a native garden uh, last year. It didn't look like anything. This year it's huge. And uh, it gives me a lot of time outside by myself. And weeding I find to be a good stress reliever. Interesting. And what are you, what are you growing in the, uh, in the garden? What do you got? Oh, all flowers. Um, and so we're, oh, waiting for the, the, yeah, we're waiting for the monarch butterflies to come because it's a, apparently a very good milkweed year and that's all they eat. So I uh, get an opportunity to watch them, which is, is kind of fun. And we've got lots of pollinators out there. All right, um, because it's a good milkweed year. You heard it here first on this. Um, all right, folks, just a, just a couple of housekeeping notes, and I'll mention this a few times throughout our session here today. Please do use the Q&A panel. Um, that's going to allow us to make sure our amazing panelists can field your questions and give you the best possible answer they can. In the Q&A panel, there is an upvote functionality. So go ahead if... Uh, Greg asks an amazing question and it's close to what I was gonna ask. Just go ahead and give Greg an upvote there. Maybe put a comment on there. Oh, I'm interested in this too. And then also before somebody asks, the recording will be made available after the fact. So no, no need to worry about furiously taking notes here. You're gonna be able to relive the glory of this session uh, you know, about 24 hours afterwards. Uh, now, before we jump into our content today, uh, just a little bit about modern sales pros. Greg, if you advance us one slide, please. Modern Sales Pros, for those of you who don't know, is the world's largest revenue leadership community for those in sales management, sales and revenue operations, sales development, sales enablement, and the related supporting disciplines. We seek to create an environment in our community where our members can come and answer and ask questions and get answers to questions about problems they'd otherwise struggle to solve on their own. As part of that, we have a very vibrant online discussion group. And then in addition, we have events like what you're going to experience today where we bring in some experts on particular topic areas to answer all your questions and educate you in today's case about really how to master your sales data. For those of you who aren't some members of the community, uh, you will be invited to join us after the fact. And one of the great parts about the community, it's not just one or two organizations that are represented. We've got about 5,500 different companies in there. So when you ask a question, you get perspectives from all across the board here. Uh, but enough about MSP. Let's actually meet our speakers today. So Greg, if you go ahead and advance this once. And uh, really excited to be working with these two. Uh, worked with Brainshark a bunch of times in the past, and they're known for bringing some of their best and brightest to share perspective with MSP. So very excited to be joined by both Greg and Liz today. Um, Greg, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the MSP community? Sure thing. Uh, hey, everybody. This is Greg Keshin. I am the Chief Product Officer here at Brainshark. And um, prior to Brainshark, I was a co-founder at a company called Reckoner, which Brainshark acquired. And um, Reckoner built and still powers all of the scorecard technology that is now uh, available inside of the Brainshark platform. So good to be with everybody today. All right. And hi, Modern Sales Pros. I'm Liz Police, the VP of Sales Enablement for Brainshark. Uh, before coming to Brainshark, I was a three-time customer and um, have spent most of my career in enablement and about half a dozen um, tech companies. 
it's an exciting it's an exciting group of speakers here today and just one more housekeeping note before uh, before I hand it over to Greg and Liz to take us through again please do use the Q&A panel that's going to help us uh, as a, as a presenter is really field those questions to the best of our ability and if maybe we don't have time to get to your question um, you know maybe Greg or Liz will follow up afterwards with some additional content or context about that. And then finally, the recording will be made available. It takes about 24 hours for Zoom to process, but once that's available, we'll share that with everybody here. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Greg and Liz to chat a little bit more about the critical role that sales enablement plays in data-driven sales and the important role that data plays in making sure our sales teams are moving uh, to, the, to the right direction here. Excellent. All right, I'll kick it off. So um, yeah, we're going to dive into basically everything that it means to uh, drive sales productivity using your data. Um, we're going to explain why sales enablement leaders are such important partners um, with sales managers and other sales leaders. And we'll take a look at some concrete examples of the sales enablement programs that um, you can run to drive more effectiveness in your sales organization. Um, so with that kind of as the background, just in terms of the agenda, we're gonna start by talking about the era of sales productivity that we're in today. Um, we're gonna answer the question of what actually is sales productivity and break it into two different components, which are efficiency and effectiveness. Um, we're gonna explain how you can create great sales enablement programs. Um, and we'll look at how sales enablement can really partner with your sales leadership um, to drive great results. Um, and then from there, we're going to dive into why data is so important in all of this uh, in terms of managing your enablement programs and making sure that they're effective. Um, and then lastly, we're going to introduce BrainShark's readiness scorecards um, as a solution that can help you to put data into what we call a coachable context um, that your sales enablement team and your managers are going to use to, uh, to drive better sales performance. All right. So kicking things off is, uh, is really the era of sales productivity. So this is kind of the big picture um, of the world that we're living in today in terms of B2B sales. Um, we describe it as the era of sales productivity, which uh, really, as we all know, is all about generating the largest possible return um, on the investment that you're making in sales and marketing to acquire a customer. So in subscription businesses, this includes the initial sale that you're making to customers, any upsell, cross-sell that's happening, as well as renewals. Um, and for a good business, you're gonna achieve as fast a payback as possible on the amount that you're investing to acquire customers. And very good companies um, are gonna generate a multiple of lifetime value against the uh, cost to acquire a customer. So ideally, we're striving for a 3X um, lifetime value over CAC. Um, this era of sales productivity um, started really when SaaS business models first became popular about 20 years ago. The concepts of LTV and, and CAC really gained popularity around 2008 um, from uh, Philippe Boteri, who kind of wrote the first popular article called The Five C's of SaaS Finance back when he was at Bessemer Ventures. And that kicked off this era that we're in today. Um, which like I said, started in SaaS, but the concept applies to all businesses where every company cares about maximizing the ratio of revenue that they're generating from their customers relative to the cost of acquiring, implementing, and supporting those customers. The impact of all this is that the days of VPs of sales who can just kind of hit the number and then go play golf are over, unfortunately for people who like golf. Um, so now what's happening is when VPs of sales are, are hitting their number, the board and executives are still looking for more. So there's always going to be demand for higher returns, for better efficiency numbers. You see that, um, you know, these LTV over CAC metrics are now part of how a company is valued um, in the market. And so there's an incredible amount of pressure on VPs of sales to continuously um, drive more efficiency and more effectiveness. And just hitting the quota is not always enough. That means that this is an extinction level event for sales leaders that aren't embracing this goal of maximizing sales productivity. Um, so it is critical stuff that we're talking about. I know there's sales leaders on the call 
I know there's people that support sales leaders on the call. So all of this is going to be uh, very critical to everybody that's here. Um, what I'm going to do now is pass it over to Liz and she's going to talk a little bit about this next generation of sales leadership that we're seeing. Thanks so much, Kesh. And yeah, we're, we're done with the dinosaur here because our sales leaders that will drive the market now and then into the future are really those that are focused on sales productivity. And from that evolution on, and focus on sales productivity came a new function called sales enablement. And those of us who are in these roles have seen all different names used and now everyone has settled on sales enablement. And that role has a real partnership with sales leadership. And the two of them work together to create a highly productive sales team. And the reason they're able to do that is because the two of them work together based upon the company revenue goals. They're both responsible for achieving those revenue goals. And then we know those revenue goals as they're set at the beginning of a year translate down into sales quotas and quotas for our individual sales reps. Once those quotas are established, the sales enablement team is responsible for creating our readiness programs. And those readiness programs are created in order to help fill our skills and knowledge gaps for those sellers. What are the things they don't have that are preventing them from achieving quota? And depending on the team or individual, it could be a variety of things, anything from their product knowledge is lacking to their inability to uh, negotiate and handle objections. And we know that utilizing data is central to the management of sales from our lead generation to opportunity creation to ultimately bookings. And our modern sales leaders are making data-driven decisions about how to maximize productivity in their sales team. So this data is crucial for sales enablement because we're interested in identifying the needs of our sellers and we want to track the completion of the programs that we've designed and assigned to them. And now more than ever, they need access to the sales performance data in order to assess whether the programs that we spend such a long time creating are working. Great. Um, so let's get the definition of sales productivity kind of out there on the table. Sales productivity is really a combination of sales efficiency, which is the quantity of output that your reps and teams are generating um, and sales effectiveness, which is the quality of that output. So the combination of efficiency and effectiveness um, is illustrated here in the graph on the right. Um, and what we're looking at is points A and points B are gonna have kind of similar uh, level of productivity. For point A, what, what's happening is you're generating a lot of output per rep, um, but the quality of that output is low. So that might be reps that are making tons of phone calls um, or opening lots of opportunities, but it's not necessarily translating into lots of results. Um, for point B, there's a low amount of output generated, but the quality of each thing is high. So that might be reps that are opening very few opportunities, but um, the very few that they, they do turn to, to good deals. Um, obviously point C is where we wanna be at, which is where um, sales productivity is high. And that's because you have a good combination of um, both efficiency and effectiveness. So you're driving enough quantity to have enough stuff in your pipeline to move through to, to deals and customers and revenue, um, but your effectiveness is good too. So you don't have terrible conversion rates um, and, uh, and that's yielding a very good result here. So let's take a look at how we actually get there. Um, and we're gonna do this in sort of a concrete example where um, we're looking at a full cycle account executive. So our full cycle AE, who is Nate here on the left, uh, bottom left of the screen, is responsible for generating business all the way from sourcing his own leads, opening up some pipeline and, and uh, all the way through to closing deals. Um, we have a sales manager, Courtney, up at the top, who she's motivated to hit her team goal. And in order to hit her team goal, she needs all of her reps to perform at a high level and hit their individual goals. So she's going to rely on metrics to give her insight into the productivity of each of her AEs. And we're going to walk through those metrics in a minute. Um, and then the other component involved here is our sales uh, enablement manager, which is Bev on the right. And Bev is a critical partner for the sales manager and for the AE. So Bev is constantly working, like Liz said, to fill in these gaps 
um, in both skills and knowledge that the reps have with training and coaching programs. So she's going to use the efficiency and effectiveness metrics that we're going to go through to identify which of the AEs need the most help, um, figure out where to help them, and also figure out whether the programs that the enablement team is creating are actually working. So let's go through the kind of the critical metrics here for full cycle AEs, and we'll break them apart into efficiency and effectiveness metrics. So starting on the efficiency side, these are things that are going to give the team a view um, really into the whole sales pipeline, the whole process, starting with the number of dials that are being made by reps and the number of emails um, that they're sending, which obviously indicate whether the reps are putting in sort of enough energy and effort into the early part of the sales process. Then you've got metrics like opportunities and pipeline, which are good indicators of whether that activity is translating into um, some sort of early results. And then you've got downstream metrics like opportunities one and bookings that are assessing um, movement in the back part of the pipeline. The other thing that's important is measuring how much current pipeline reps actually have. And this is um, often critical to make sure that reps aren't falling into that pattern where they kind of alternate their time between generating pipeline and closing pipeline and making sure that people have a, a consistent balance um, over time, so they never have one of those uh, goose egg type of months or goose egg quarters where they just have nothing in the tank left to close. Then we get over to the effectiveness metrics, and these are also important, but for kind of different reasons. And what these do is they let you double check what's happening with a rep or with a team. So um, for instance, an account executive might have really strong efficiency metrics on the left-hand side, but is still not performing at the level that um, you want them to. And that might be because they have a low ASP or a low um, close rate. So by contrast, the reps that are doing really well um, are gonna be generating high quality deals that are gonna have a higher ASP, close at a higher rate, and, um, and the sales cycle is gonna be a lot shorter. So those metrics, you can look at individually. You can also combine them into what we call super metrics like sales velocity, um, which kind of combine a number of these things together to assess um, reps and, and teams with each other. Yeah, I think we, we love talking about sales velocity and it's something uh, the community had a chance to learn about from Mark uh, Roberge in July. So really, really great stuff there. One of the questions when we start to talk about metrics, and I know I'm putting you guys a little bit on the spot with this, what's your favorite vanity metric? Right, you, you know, that, that one metric where it's like, it doesn't actually matter that much in a vacuum. And I know you guys probably yeah. have a ton, uh, but what's, what's your favorite vanity metric and kind of like why? Well, I think the one that's the most common really is looking at a pipeline generated metric. And um, it demonstrates the importance of having both the efficiency and the effectiveness metrics because lots of companies get so hung up on pipeline generated, pipeline generated but don't look at the conversion rate downstream to, is that turning into deals? Is that turning into revenue? Um, and you can end up uh, fooling yourself if you're not looking at how that's actually progressing through the, through the rest of the sales process. Yeah. Liz, a favorite, Hi. do you have a favorite one or is it also I just do have, I do have a favorite one, Rich, Dials. Dials makes me a little nuts. Uh, and the, I, I get this question all the time of, you know, how do we know whether our reps have actually been active during the day? D dials, emails, we have a lot of data about our reps now, but I am most concerned with how effective they are on the phone. If you're making 10 great phone calls a day versus 50 smiling dials, um, that is certainly more important to our pipeline build. So I think it is something for everybody to, to watch for and say, well, that, that may not be our best indicator, but it is an indicator of whether the rep is actually engaging with customers. Yeah, and it's I, a I good love, question. Love... I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you asked it because it does demonstrate, like looking at any one of these things in a vacuum is, is just gonna give you bad results. You gotta be sort of monitoring both sides of, uh, both sides of this coin and, and uh, looking at a 360 degree view of what a rep is doing. It definitely, the, the sales velocity equation, I know it's a bit gnarly for some folks that 
maybe said, hey, I'm in sales, I got to get out of math. Um, it is something that it does pull a lot of this together because to both your points, right, there's the efficiency, like I can call the public library and sit on the phone for 10 minutes. Right. And that person maybe doesn't, doesn't want to have a future in sales and that's a hiring problem. But we've had, we've had people on talk about that where they were just tracking dials and it turns out that every week Greg is calling this one number and spending forever on the phone. How is that not an opportunity yet? Oh man, Greg's actually getting story time or whatever it might be. Um, but putting those two things together does make this very real. And it's an important point to call out for the MSP audience where each one of these things put together presents a really effective story and it's a good master metric-ish way to look at the uh, efficiency of everything that's going on. Yep, exactly right. All right, so if you uh, if dials is also your favorite and you should think then about how sales enablement plays a critical role into all the metrics that you're tracking. As I said, we have a lot of data uh, on sales reps, but ma mapping the necessary skills and knowledge to the efficiency metrics they drive is really important. So there are two things that come out of this. Uh, first, if your sales enablement team creates a comprehensive set of programs and you ha may have your sales enablement team running five to 10 programs at a time, aligning those to the sales performance metrics that you agreed to at the beginning of your year is the best way to start. And second, taking that combination of the efficiency metrics and the enablement programs makes it possible to diagnose where problems might exist with your sellers, either in terms of the fundamental skills or the advanced selling skills that are required at different phases of the sales cycle. Um, and what's important to note here is that we've given you a, a mapping that is general across the B2B sales context. It's not necessary for you to think about an exact mapping here um, and what's unique to, to your particular sales process. These are some example things that we see across all of our customers. So let's look at an example. Uh, if we see that a sales rep is not creating opportunities, Based upon the mapping that we've got here, the rep, the manager, and the sales enablement person can easily diagnose where we might have a problem. So we might have a problem with our early pipeline selling skills and knowledge, and the sales leader would then look to sales enablement to identify classes or curriculums that might be available to help that rep. And if a program doesn't exist, the information that we have here can tell sales enablement where to spend their time and energy. So where they should prioritize their efforts to create additional trainings that may help this individual rep or an entire team of reps. If we move on then to our effectiveness metrics, the, as we said earlier, it's, 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 it's good for our reps to be extremely efficient. Uh, but it's really important for them to be effective with the time they spend. So they can make 10 really good calls a day or they can smile and dial on the movie line. And many people here may not even know what the movie line used to be, but I called it when I was a sales rep. Um, so <laughs> and as, as we come to the end of Q3 as sales leaders uh, in any position, you should know that there is still time to improve and really thinking about what makes your sales reps most effective. It's about working smarter and not harder. Um, so the types of programs that uh, impact our effectiveness are programs that relate to a more effective sales process. And utilizing these skills helps a rep in every phase of the sales process. Even calls and emails can be more effective. Uh, if they are calling on and emailing the right companies with the right profile. And we know it doesn't happen by random luck. It's about paying attention to your effectiveness metrics. Uh, like the efficiency metrics, effectiveness me metrics we find to be universal. So it doesn't matter in particular how your sales process is set up or what CRM that you're currently using. So we explained how sales efficiency and sales effectiveness um, work together in order to drive productivity. So we've also shown how our sales managers and sales enablement leaders can use these metrics in order to organize your programs, diagnose problems, and then really work together to help improve results. So now that we've got all of these programs and you've created uh, them to fill those skills and knowledge gaps, the question is how do you manage the strategy after a rollout? Because things can get pretty busy very quickly. I'm already looking at Q4 and going, oh my goodness, there's so much here. And I know many of our BrainShark customers are managing programs for huge geographically distributed teams all over the world. And it's even more true now in our B2B world 
because most of us are still working from home or working remotely. And the answer is that we need to use the data for measuring our enablement programs and also putting that data together with our sales productivity metrics. So we know that there's some significant benefits uh, to managing our sales enablement programs using data. First, with the great data, we can, we can keep track of everything that in the past might have been disorganized. You need to know that your programs are getting rolled out effectively and that people are completing the courses and curriculums you spent such a long time developing. Data makes it possible for us to do that in very large teams. Who's completed what, where did they stand? Secondly, data makes it possible for us to diagnose where problems are not only in the field, but also with the, the learning that we are expecting our sellers to do. Our worlds are constantly changing and there are new things our sellers need to be updated on. When you combine your enablement data with your CRM performance data, you can diagnose areas where performance is weak and figure out how to help those sellers move forward. Prioritizing that work is, off, is often difficult. Um, I have a small sales enablement team, I'm sure many of you do too, and with good data, you can see what's working, what's not, and where to put your resources. And for our sellers, when we have great data about not only enablement, but also performance, we can easily show it to them and we know our sales reps are competitive. And they want to know where they stand relative to their peers. No sales rep likes to be at the bottom of the pack. And data also gives the sales enablement professional and the sales leader and also the rep a common view of what's really going on so that we can diagnose problems and work together on solutions. And it creates that transparency to hold everyone accountable so that there's no finger pointing in your organization. We all know where we stand and what we're working towards. And finally, we know that it creates a, a virtuous cycle because when you quickly identify problems using data and you take action and then you see great results, it fuels everyone and motivates them towards escalating and elevating your program and driving towards productivity and higher quota attainment. That's right. So um, obviously data is a powerful tool for driving your sales productivity forward. Um, sales enablement teams are in a really good position to take advantage of all the data that we've got these days, both from um, your enablement programs and from the CRM for all the reasons that we just discussed. But it's important to note, I think we all know this, but when it comes to using data, more is not um, always better and more sometimes can actually be worse if it becomes overwhelming. So I definitely encourage everybody to avoid the, the pitfall of uh, trying to overdo it with too many metrics and too much stuff from too many different places. Um, and, uh, and really keep it focused on what's going to drive those conversations forward, especially in, in, in this topic, it's um, especially important in these weekly one-on-ones that sales reps are having with their sales managers. Um, you really want to keep the, uh, the scope of what you're putting in front of people pretty focused. So what I'm going to talk about are the um, brain shark readiness scorecards. Um, and we're going to show you why we recommend this scorecard type of a format for your sales data, both on the enablement side and the performance side. So the first thing is that what scorecards do is they put the data that you um, want to have in front of your reps and managers into what we call a coachable context. Um, and you can use that to help your sales teams and your sales reps. Um, also, what a scorecard does is it provides a single pane of glass that the whole team can use. So um, it's designed in a way where it's accessible, digestible, understandable for the enablement team for the sales managers and for the individual reps. Um, I'm sure everybody here has had the experience where you've got sales managers looking at one thing, enablement looking at something else, sales reps maybe looking at a, a totally different thing. So having that single pane of glass is important because if you're trying to coach people on something, you have to agree on um, why it is that, that you're generating that sort of coaching recommendation in the first place. Um, and then finally, scorecards, uh, they combine data from both your, your readiness, um, which is your learning and coaching, as well as the efficiency and effectiveness data that we've been talking about, which comes from the CRM. So what that does is it makes it possible to actually assess whether your reps are um, ready to sell by using the learning and coaching data. 
diagnose if it's actually work by using the, the CRM data and the results that reps are having. And I, I love this point. And we had a couple questions that came in actually during registration about sort of tools and like Salesforce, I think is, or a CRM is kind of a no brainer here, but like Looker, Tableau, you can, you can kind of do some of this stuff there. Like what's the, how does that all, how do you, how do you see those things hanging together? Yeah, what we find is that, um, first of all, Salesforce is obviously a great tool for the data capture not necessarily a great tool in all cases for um, what you're trying to do here, which is putting that data into the coachable context where it's really focused around the reps. Um, there are tools out there, like you mentioned, Looker, Tableau, Domo, BI tools like that, which are um, good largely for kind of high level executive dashboards about how's the business doing? Um, you know, how is like the enterprise versus mid-market team doing that kind of stuff. But even with those tools, they're not really designed in such a focused way to give you that coachable context around an individual rep. Um, and in a lot of cases, they're not pre-designed with what you need to have all of the right KPIs and metrics about your reps right out of the box. And um, I, I've probably talked to, I don't know, 50, 100 people that have had the horror story of being stuck in line with their BI team, waiting for months for, you know, whatever they've asked them for. And then once they finally get it back, it's like, well, now my needs have changed. And <laughs> now I'm back, back, back at the end of the line again. So we do find that, um, you know, there's a lot of constraints on BI teams from around the whole business and, and sales often is not prioritized as high as you might otherwise expect. All right, so I just mentioned coachable context. So what does that really mean? Um, first piece of it obviously is, uh, is looking at the, the context. So everything in this webinar so far is about improving the productivity of your sales reps and your sales teams. In order to do that, you need to get the data that you have into a shape where it's all focused around the reps and around the teams. So. Um, you know, it's not just a massive export of all the data from your CRM about your opportunities, but instead it's organized by rep um, and can be used to compare uh, reps to each other or compare teams to each other as well. So this is particularly helpful for enablement teams to see if their programs are improving over time by looking at different cohorts of reps and, you know, can we get people on, onboarded more quickly? Are we getting people more effective? Um, in the first 90 days that they're on board, et cetera. So what the scorecards do is automatically organize all of that data. So things like courses, curriculums, coaching activity, um, and the CRM data into that context where it's all pivoted around the rep um, so that it's readily available in a way that shows how the reps are doing, how the programs are doing. Um, and like I said before, you don't need to get into the back of the line with the BI team um, to get, you know, your ticket through that, that shows you this data in the way that it's going to be useful. What actually makes all this stuff coachable, um, there's kind of three critical components that scorecards do to make the data actionable or, or coachable. Um, the first is diagnosing problems. So that's diagnosing what reps and teams actually need help with. And this is done by comparing reps and teams to each other. So for instance, comparing a new hire class um, or within a new hire class, comparing those reps to each other is important because you can't compare a rep that's been there for 20 days with somebody that's been in the seat for a year. The results aren't going to be the same. But with a new hire class, comparing them together makes sense so that you can make sure that everybody's on the ramp trajectory um, that you need them to be on to get to productivity and the amount of time that um, you've allotted for that. The second thing is motivating sales reps to improve. Um, we all know that by and large sales reps are very competitive. No one wants to be at the bottom of any type of a list. So exposing the data in a way that people are compared um, and benchmarked against their peers really motivates reps to want to improve. Um, and then the third is holding reps accountable to what you're talking about, especially in the context of weekly one-on-ones. So what we actually have um, inside of the scorecards is ability to log notes and action items between the manager and the rep um, or the sales enablement team can get involved here as well so that 
you're not just having these conversations and then everything is kind of floating off into the ether and then next week everybody forgets, but instead you can write down, um, you know, what the action items are or what the goals are and then follow up on those things so that everybody is held accountable to the commitments they're making to um, perform and to improve. So um, finally with scorecards, you can also integrate Salesforce data as well um, and combine that with your training and coaching data to show um, your efficiency and effectiveness metrics right there in the scorecards alongside how people are progressing through onboarding programs or, or other training. Um, so combining in the CRM data has an even greater impact on sales performance in terms of diagnosing the problems um, both enablement leaders and sales managers can really see where in the sales process a given rep is struggling. And what that lets you do is figure out um, which reps need help and, and which programs to develop to help with the skills that can improve that part of the process like Liz um, was illustrating earlier. Uh, with respect to motivating reps to improve, um, the CRM data helps to benchmark these reps on their performance results. And when the reps are seeing themselves behind the pack or behind one of their peers, that motivates them to actually seek out and take the training and coaching that they need to improve so that instead of seeing these enablement programs as just a chore that I have to do, they actually see the impact that it has on their success. So I'm not just taking this course because somebody told me to take the course. I'm now taking the course because I want to, because I see you know, I'm not closing as many deals as, uh, as one of my peers. And, uh, and this is going to have an impact on my success at the company and, and on my career. And then the third thing is in terms of accountability for that continuous improvement, pulling in the CRM data lets you track all of these KPIs over time. And now you've got a sense of whether a rep is improving um, and whether the, the uh, training that you're putting in front of them is actually having an impact. So for sales enablement um, leaders, this really helps you prove out the value that you're providing to the business. And it helps you, um, you know, focus in on the reps and make sure that they are, uh, you know, improving their results consistently month over month and quarter over quarter. So in, in summary, uh, what we talked about today is that the new era of sales is here. Both sales leaders and the entire sales management team need to focus on sales productivity. That's key. And it isn't just enough to hit the number anymore. You need to hit the number while making your teams more efficient and more effective. And in this era, the sales enablement team has become critical. Uh, to success of the business and the role of enablement is all about improving those efficiency and effectiveness metrics and helping the sales team find the skills and knowledge they need in order to hit quota. And we've seen the data is essential for managing those enablement programs, but not just any data. That scorecards are the best way to, for us to put it into coachable context so that we all have a common view of what's happening in the field and we can take action as a team to improve performance. So thanks so much for spending time with us here. I think we're going to answer some questions. Yeah, this was this was phenomenal, Greg and Liz. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing. I think there's a lot here. One of the questions, and I'm going to direct this one towards Liz. We talked about it a little bit in prep. It's also come in live. So much of sales enablement is becoming a more data-driven discipline. And there's a lot of folks that are saying, hey, I'm an ops. I've got a data mindset. How do I make that transition or what tips or tricks do you have for folks making a transition from maybe more of a sales ops role into a sales enablement role? So I, I would start by saying it's a great start uh, because you already understand the data and you've had some exposure to your business. And as you're thinking about additional skill sets that you may want to add in order to make that transition, I would argue that number one, adult learning principles are key. And having that knowledge, you can, there are plenty of courses available for you to take uh, so that you understand how the adults that you'll be working with uh, can best learn and grow in their roles. Uh, additionally, facilitation is a really important part of what we do in sales enablement, whether that's something that we do now on Zoom uh, or in the future back to a, a live classroom. 
Uh, as well, there are multiple different types of roles in enablement, whether you're someone who is most interested in, in teaching directly, like we're, we're working on today, or uh, whether you would be a behind the scenes field coach working on strategy, whether you're someone that likes to work on uh, consistent programs like an onboarding program. Uh, in the, any of those cases, project management is a really important skill to have. And then uh, executive presence and communication. The sales enablement leaders tend to be bridge builders across the different departments of the organization that support the sales team. And in, in order to communicate with them and understand how they do their everyday jobs, I would focus there. I, and forming a great relationship with the sales leaders that you work with now is really important so that you understand how they, they think about their sales teams and the success and getting some focus uh, right away. I think that's, I think those are, those are great lessons. And I think even if there's somebody in sales management, I think the adult learning principles are phenomenal skills to have when you're running a team that's very busy and very high performing in some ways. And then in other ways uh, has, massive opportunity to grow and learn and evolve. Um, so that's, that's awesome, Liz. Thank you for that. Another, another great question that came in, um, and this is, this is one from registration. Uh, Greg, I'm going to tee you up with this one. And it's just a notion of kind of tying this all together. I think the, the question that came in was around how do, we, how do we model this to make sure that we've got our people doing the, the best work that they can? How do we look at it from a lead perspective? Um, what would be interesting to talk about here is you talked about effectiveness and efficiency metrics. Maybe just doubling down a little bit more on the importance of some of those efficiency metrics and how that can help you plan your organization in a way that's meaningful. Yeah, I mean, looking at the efficiency metrics, especially, um, well, really both sides of the coin can be helpful because um, what you find is sometimes it's an issue with uh, the, the people. And that's mostly what we've been centered on in this webinar is how can the sales enablement team um, use data and these KPIs to figure out which people need help and which part of the process they need help with, and then um, put the programs together that will strengthen the skills that get them better at that. The other thing that looking at this data can do is find things that might not be people specific, but might be you know, related to things like the leads that you're generating. Um, and those might be the bottleneck. Usually if um, it's not just one person struggling in a part of the sales process, um, but instead it's everybody, then that probably means it's, it's not such a people specific thing and unless um, maybe you need to like train everybody on uh, the messaging around your product or something like that. But if for instance, everybody is struggling with converting leads to opportunities, maybe you ought to be also looking at the leads um, and bringing marketing into the conversation, for instance, in order to make sure that, uh, that it's not a people problem and it might actually be something with your marketing programs targeting the wrong audience or something like that. But I think that probably the audience here is a mix between um, sales ops and sales enablement, but people in both of those roles are in sort of the prime position uh, to identify, okay, there's an issue. Let's take a look at what it might be. Is it a people thing? Okay, cool. Let's develop some programs. Is it maybe a marketing thing? Let's bring them into the conversation, but I'd encourage everybody to try to be one of those bridges across the organization that can spot issues and, um, and then bring in the right people to solve them. It's an important strategic perspective too to have as folks up level their careers to say, hey, this isn't just, it's not just the leads are bad or the sales reps are lazy. It's actually a combination of, um, of these things. Yeah, the people that can, that can figure out where in the organization the issue is, those are valuable people. And like you said, generally, those are the people that are going to make it to a sort of a higher level in the org so that they have that purview to take a look at all this data from. Oh, I think, and there's a there's there's been a lot on that sort of organizational uh, communication and all of that's doubly important now as folks are trying to figure out, hey, we're in a, we're in a new world or a pandemic society or whatever you want to call it. Um, Liz, I wanted to pose a question to you, and this this comes up a lot in um, you know in the modern sales community, right? There's a lot of tools out there, and it feels like there's there's new tools every day for everything that could be out there. Where does that fit into this um, into this scheme? You know, how do you think about it? Is it effectiveness? Is it efficiency? Is it like, how does it all work in that world? Oh, so we, I, I can say definitely. Uh, our, our own selling teams probably have 12 different tools that they use. And I'm sure uh, larger organizations can even come up with more. 
uh, as we're thinking about it, the, the first level um, is about how we, we need to get them into those foundational skills, how to use the tools in general so that they can email, that they can use cadences so that they can dial the phone. Right? And then once we've gotten past that, there is a higher level skill set that I think is all around uh, how effective they can be in terms of reaching out to their, uh, the buyers that are most important, to how to engage them with the tools that we've given them and the information that they've gathered using those tools. So it's really a combination of both, but I would say your, your foundational skills on how to utilize those tools, we see them as um, how efficient they are using them. I think that's a that's a great point, and I think it's it's something too where like being being deliberate and intentional about how those tools help, also helps you figure out how you're going to train people. Right? Don't buy a tool in search of a problem because it's got great marketing. As much as I would hate to say that, but you want it. You want to be deliberate about your investments, right? Right, and I, I would say, Rich, that that it's important for us to think about the tool set that you have as part of what enablement does. I have a, a revenue operations team I work with. Well, they manage those tools. We enable on them. Uh, and it is a very cyclical thing because there's new technology available all the time and we want our sellers to be as efficient and effective as they can be using them. And uh, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a constant keep up with it. Every quarter we, we go back and review. And I think that's something too, we've heard a bunch of, from all different walks and the MSP panel conversations we've had, we're really being deliberate, reviewing the tools that you're using, reviewing the state of the market, making sure you're getting the outcomes unlocked that you want, and also understanding your vendors that you're working with don't stand still. Uh, they're, they're moving and they're growing and they're evolving in completely new directions. So um, be, be intentional about that as well. I, this is a great question that came in from, uh, from Ben on uh, the Groove team. Greg, I'm going to pose this to you first, but Liz, I'm sure you have perspective here as well. Across all the, all the different conversations that you're, you're having and that you're seeing, what do sales teams mess up the most when it comes to sales productivity? Or what's, what's a common mis, misconception or misrepresentation here? Yeah, it is a good question. I have I have sort of two concepts to talk through different ones. Um, I think the first the first one that companies do pretty commonly is uh, looking too much at the average overall for the whole team, um, and not looking at things in terms of the individuals. Because a lot of times, what happens is you have a couple of very good reps that are sort of carrying the the load for the whole team and lifting up the average for everybody. And what that hides, if you end up just looking at the average is, you know, it hides the fact that you might have some people that are struggling. It might be quite possible to move those struggling reps up so that they're productive as well. And by doing that, like the efficiency of, of the team and the productivity of the yeah. team is going to go up significantly. So I guess don't rest on your laurels if the if the team overall is doing well, but make sure you're also focused on um, the spread of the individuals. The other concept I would say is not to get, um, you know, too wrapped up in just like the, the front piece of that LTV over CAC equation, meaning don't necessarily be celebrating like, like you won, <laughs> like you won the Super Bowl if you're good at landing customers, but make sure that you're looking at the whole um, customer life cycle and segment by segment understanding if those customers actually grow with you, whether they stick with you and renew over time. Um, cause if they don't, then you might have a good ability to land a customer, but poor, you know, LTV over CAC metrics. And again, those things can be kind of hidden within the averages. Um, if you're not looking at things closely enough. And to, to further in terms of that, what sales enablement would think about there is we may have a standard set of metrics that we're tracking as a business uh, and which metrics are most important if we picked three or four of them, depending on your role, you need to decide on that uh, and say, I have five or six roles, um, meaning selling roles in our business. And from there, we're watching those specific metrics at a team and an individual level and acknowledging that they're going to change depending on where they touch the customer in that life cycle. As well, we develop different programs for an ADR, SDR role than we do for an account management role because they're different. It's a different set of knowledge and skill set, uh, some more advanced than others. And when we look 
at the individuals who might be lagging, we also need to consider not only their tenure within the company, but the skills and knowledge they're potentially bringing with them uh, from previous roles. Are they experienced sellers that just are not onboarded yet? Or are, is this their first role out of college and potentially we have some other business level skills we need to teach? I think those are those are both great points. And and Greg, I want to just double click into the point that you made about sort of the averages before. Um, I, I think maybe an example of that or a world where that's a little bit more dangerous than others. Maybe it's a certain deal cycle or velocity where averages can really, really get you into trouble. I think we'll make it very real for the uh, for our audience. Yeah, I mean, certainly if you're if your average deal sizes are very big, then um... <laughs> then you can run into big issues where like one person hits one good deal, but the team overall is actually 90% struggling. So, um, but, but I think those are a little bit more obvious in nature because you're, you're, you're kind of on top of all the deals. I think really for, it's for any size business, you just need to make sure that um, you're looking at the distribution of performance of reps um, compared to each other. And then also compared over time, because that's another thing that can get people is like, mm. oh yeah, this rep is doing fine. They hit their quota last quarter. It's like, okay, yeah, but look at the pre previous three. Maybe they um, struggled through those and they just cleared out their pipeline most recently. So um, it does take some effort because you got to you got to be diligent about it and be really inspecting the entire team. But um, but the only way to really boost the effectiveness of the whole team is uh is looking at everybody and and in context of each other and, and over time and it it seems like too it's it's also we, we mentioned the front part of the scenario but also if you're um if you're looking at um you know just paying out certain folks on your team right if i'm at 200 percent of quota and everybody else is at zero I'm, I'm going to get a really really big paycheck the sales team is going to look decidedly average and our cost of acquiring that customer is going to be way out of whack relative to what if everyone was performing at an average level would be. So it's actually, there's another level to it there as well sure. for folks to, for folks to keep in mind. Uh, yeah, getting true. a lot of love in the comments section about looking at the, looking at the sort of the distribution, not just the averages across the board. So great point on that, Greg. Um, last question, and this is a, a brain shark specific question. So if we want to take it offline to go deep, that's fine too. But I think it actually would be helpful for um, Greg and Liz, you to just provide a little bit of perspective on the product itself. And the, the question here is about brain shark and can it help with both the data component and the coachable scorecards element of it? Or does it focus a little bit more on one or the other? Yeah, it's a good question. So I'll give you like the quick, like what actually is BrainShark. Um, it's a sales enablement platform with four kind of key components. One is you can create training content um, for your reps to consume. So you can create training courses and curriculums. Um, two is reps can take that training in sort of an LMS within the, uh, within the platform. Three is we have a coaching piece where reps can actually practice their sales pitch and practice delivering the message that you want without putting them out there on a live phone call with a customer before they're ready. And then the fourth element are our scorecards. And what the scorecards do is they take all the brain shark um, data about, you know, learning and coaching and how reps are progressing through their onboarding curriculums and how they're doing on these practice sessions. And they combine that with data from Salesforce um, that show exactly those KPIs that we were reviewing earlier in the call, everything ranging from phone calls and emails through to pipeline generated and ASP and close rate, et cetera. So they do help with sort of both of those items that were asked in the question with both getting the data together. Um, it basically automatically calculates all of those KPIs so you don't have to like export a million uh, Salesforce reports into spreadsheets and build pivot tables and formulas and things. Does that automatically per rep? So you can see that distribution of reps, organizes it into your team so you can see the distribution of teams. Um, and then there's kind of views inside of that scorecard application that are specifically designed for sales managers when they're having one-on-ones with reps, um, kind of paints the full picture of performance of that rep ranging from uh, learning and coaching through to the performance data, and then also has some of these other components that we talked about, like being able to keep track of 
notes and action items and, and discussion points so that it's all like they're self-contained in one system and people aren't bouncing back and forth between different places. Every, every sales ops person on the call breathed a sigh of relief when you said, oh no, it's gonna <laughs> automatically put this in teams and uh, individual level, this is great. And again, we can uh, follow up with more information about uh, BrainShark and the team afterwards. Uh, but folks, we're almost at time here. Uh, Greg, Liz, I know you're both incredibly, incredibly busy people. The start to uh, start to a month is always a tricky time. Um, thank you guys both for sharing your time and your expertise with MSP today. It was awesome. I've got a whole bunch of notes here. And on behalf of the team behind the scenes, Hannah and the rest, and then the 20,000 folks in the community, um, thank you guys so, so much. This has been really, really awesome and really fun. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, everybody. We enjoyed it. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.